Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Coker, and the Old Santee Canal Park are, are our neighbors, and are our great neighbors, but I represent the Berkeley County Museum and Heritage Center. You see a picture of it here. This is a 1992 building meant to look like an old Berkeley County plantation. So lots of those up and down the Cooper River. So please come in and see us, about 5,600 square feet. Uh, there's a few shots of what we look like. We have everything from fossils to Santee Cooper project to race car drivers. So we try to really cover a wide spectrum. Uh, that, of course, is the sign for the gate. We're just to the right when you get in. Now, you notice that there's a spot over here for a picture, and that was deliberately left blank for a reason, because we are, fingers crossed, hoping that we're going to get uh, blessed with accommodations tax grant, and that we're going to use that money to do a brand new revolutionary war exhibit in Berkeley County. Uh, we have two cannons that were recovered at Lewis Field Plantation, and these are British guns. Uh, they are very rare. One of them is in terrible condition. It actually has saran wrap wrapped around the barrel. Uh, children were picking it to pieces, and that was a quick fix to put saran wrap around it, but there's no reason an 18th century, or, you know, that 18th century artifact should have saran wrap around it. So we have talked to the people, the Warren Lash Lab, the folks who did the good work on the Hunley, and we have gotten a nice estimate. So we're hoping to get those cannons restored, put carriages that are period appropriate on them, and put them on display to sort of be key pieces. So next time I do this presentation, hopefully you'll see those two cannons there, along with a brand new Revolutionary War exhibit. Um, our neighbor, another neighbor of ours, is Fort Fairlawn. Been quiet, but not so much recently, but a lot of activity happening next to the folks at the Berkeley Conservation Trust and the Battlefield Trust. We'll get into more of that in just a minute. Now, before I begin the presentation, this is my bibliography. This isn't everything, but this was what was most helpful, and it is a reason, not just because his last name starts with a B, Baxley, <laughs> that he's up top. Because this thing that Charles shared with me is the single most useful document I have in my arsenal for this. Charles, uh, have you published it yet? Has it gone up yet? It is a rough draft of an article he wrote about the raid of Fort Fairlawn. And he's done a tremendous job of researching it and putting out some great questions that still remain for a South Carolina Department of Archives and History book. Uh, short resources of Berkeley County it has a wealth of information. In it. And coincidentally enough, we have a lot of these books for sale. So, have it at the table of that. Now, Fort Fairlawn, I sort of see as shield bear of the revolution. And the term shield bear actually goes back to the old days, knights, the Romans. These are the attendants who carry the shield of arm, shield or arms for warrior, basically freeing them up so that they could fight. And I think that's a wonderful analogy for the structure of Fort Fairlawn. Fort Fairlawn is going to certainly serve as a shield there for the British forces in South Carolina. Now let me see if my uh, we got Monk's Corner right there, Fort Fairlawn, and we're not too far from it. In 1780, of course, the British captured Charlestown after the longest siege of the war. And you hear me say Charleston, but of course we know before 1783 we're talking about Charlestown. They made a series of forts in the interior to kind of consolidate their rule, quell the backcountry. They built one at the headwaters of the Cooper River, uh, right over there where you see uh, Fairlawn, roughly 30 miles north. This was the most significant outpost between Charleston and Camden. It protected troop maneuvers. It uh, allowed them to deploy before and after Utah Springs, and also was vital for the communication lines within South Carolina. Now, this is a archaeological report that was done in 1990 that shows, and I say Fort Fairlawn, but Keith Gordine, I know you're out, you have to tell me the redoubt is probably actually more accurate term, is that right? Well, I'm going to say Fort, but if you get into the technical military terms, it's actually called the redoubt. But Fort Fairlawn is what I'm going to stick with. This is an illustration of the fort, the redoubt. It's spread out. It is two fortifications strung out. Some accounts say half a mile. Even from contemporaries who were there say half a mile. But the most reliable that I've been able to find is about a mile. They could see each other, but they were in very easy supporting distance of one another. It was a place I think they kind of thought that if we have enough force there, we'll be able to protect it, rush from location to location. Now, Fairlawn Barry 
sometimes called fair lawn two words. And I've also seen it with an E on the end of lawn. It was granted to uh, Peter Colleton, whose father had been one of the original lords of the John's grandson is known as the Honorable, was a planter, member of the Brown Council, and the first Colleton to live within South Carolina borders. Uh, he built a large brick house, and it's sometimes referred to as the Colleton House or the Colleton Castle. I've seen Colton Mansion as well. Uh, and I love the quote, of course, very magnificent. When the Colton of of course, very magnificent is the quote for babies. The house is ringed by my French terror, Abbotty, is that right? Military historian? Sharp and logs, basically uh, sort of uh, to keep the troops at bay. They would have to hack through them to get. So they're using this, uh, this fort in the house, uh, or excuse me, the house is ringed by these. Uh, a fortification ringed by the Abbey to keep people from attacking. So the house is also a military installation in that regard. It's going to come up later in the presentation. The house is also a supply depot. And you'll see a note more of that. Now, before we get into the main battle, or the main skirmish of Fort Fairmont, we have to talk about Aunt So. Is that correct, you guys? So, Ruth? Yeah? I never took French. <laughs> and I'm from Connecticut. So All right. I'm, All right good. I'm going to say for so until I run across a, a family member in France. Now, in 1780, they start constructing a fortification. There are a group of loyalist women who are there at the Colleton House, and there's an incident reported April 14, 1780. Two dragoons of the British Legion attempt to assault Lady Colleton. Now, I say assault because the real word is a lot of there, which is rape. And that's essentially what, they, what tried to happen. Uh, they come in, one of the gentlemen has a broadsword in his hand, and slashes at her, demanding to know where the rebels are. She apparently got a severe cut. Uh, luckily, she's able to get away. And the dragoons leave after procuring a jump of rice. Now, this happens again. A second incident, the same two men, Pat and Fazell. Now she is a wife of a Patriot surgeon named Peter Fazell. She's with Miss Betty Giles and Miss Jane Russell. And one of these uh, sales, his name is Henry McDonald, is he actually strangles her before the assault. Now the accounts of what happened then are varied. I found one account that says that she was sexually assaulted by the Instagram. Another account says that she was uh, able to get away. Regardless of it, they are going to arrest these two dragoons. Carlton is going to be the one to arrest them. Major Patrick Ferguson of King's Mountain Bank is going to demand that they be lined up and executed. Uh, they send them to Charleston and they have an official military inquiry and they decide that these gentlemen will be whipped for their crime but not executed. Now Carlton uh, is known as a, this group's done a great job debunking the myths of Charlton, but he generally remembered history because he's a cruel man. Well, he was very uh, accommodating towards Miss Fazell, horrified what had transpired, and sent a search and attend to her, and also put a detail of guards around the house to make sure nothing further would happen. Now, I'm going to set the stage for the skirmish of Fort Fairmont. Uh, it was significant <coughs> use before and after the Battle of Utah Springs. The Battle of Utah Springs, last major Revolutionary War engagement in South Carolina. Estimates always vary, but uh, one account says the numbers that you see up there, which is pretty significant. Uh, how those both together, that's, that's a heck of a battle. Uh, that illustration that you see there is a painting from Mr. Wilson that Robert Wilson hangs in our museum. We have one of his neighbors here, our former neighbor. Mr. Wilson is still with us. He's in his 90s. He has an art show. That's He's a World be War II veteran. World War II veteran. Yeah, he and uh, Gaffney sat down there and have an exhibition with some of his original artwork. And uh, Mr. Wilson was not trying to be 100% historically accurate. We know that with the flag and the buttons and the swords. What he's trying to do is capture the moment, the heroism of the Patriots at that battle, the put Francis Mary front and center. And he, I think he captured that nicely. So we're proud to have his painting in there, despite some of the historical inaccuracies. <coughs> and this is actually an 1862 railroad map. The reason I threw this up here is because it shows some of the places still around using the same names, uh, even after the revolution. Now, out the Utah Springs, they're going to uh, have kind of a chase to the Cooper. 
Swamp Fox, Francis Reagan, and Light Horse Harry Lee, Robert Lee Spencer, are going to go in pursuit of General Stuart. Now, the British are going to survive the Battle of Eagle Springs, of course, and they're going to manage to regroup and get the forces back together. They've abandoned just about all of the coasts by this time, and so Fort Farrell is sort of a, a, a northern end to it. And you see, sort of, Santee, uh, the North Santee River is sort of like a uh, barrier, northern end of it. Now, uh, Marion circles looking for a way to get up the British, uh, force them out of Wantu. About seven miles north of Fort Farallon, Wantu Plantation, the British have encamped in force. Now, they are using that uh, for raiding and pillaging the upcountry, St. Stephen's, St. John area, and they've got to get these guys out. The commanders from the Patriot side, of course, you see Nathaniel Green up there, Marion, uh, Shelby, and I like to think that's me right over there. But uh, I think Keith may have brought a portrait of uh, Hezekiah Mayhem, fame Mayhem Towers uh, over there, but this illustration is the best I can find. These are some of the key Patriot players in this skirmish. Now, after they ambush at Parker's Ferry and the Battle of Utah Springs, Marion's forces are depleted. This isn't due to battlefield, but the fact that these men need to go home. They need to take care of their families and their farms. And so he's going to have a supplement forces of Shelby and Sevier's over mountain men. The over the mountain men, these are hardy veterans of King's Mountain, a lot of them. Uh, these men are need to go home too. So, so while he's got them, he needs to use them. So Marion is circling the British, looking at Wantu, looking at North Carolina. He detaches 500 men, roughly, under Colonel Mayhem, accompanied by the Over Mountain Men. And of course, uh, this is reenactors for training the Over Mountain Men, uh, and they settle on packing Fort Farrell. Now, Charles sent me this map uh, not that long ago. It was something done by the Civil War Trust, and they did an excursion out to Fort Farrell. It's pretty good, but there's a couple of things I, I want to point out about this later. But this gives you an idea of how spread out it is. The Redoubt here, Cooper River here, and then Calton Castle, the house. So that is where they have the Abitee around it. That's where Mr. Lizzo was attacked by the Dragoons. And so there's a big uh, walk, about a mile or so, from place to place. Now, about 8 a.m., November 17, 1781, Patriot forces arrived at Fort Farallon. They look at the fort, the redoubt, they say there's no way we're taking that thing head on. It's too formidable. They are also worried about apparently they've stirred up some British cavalry by passing through this area. They know that cavalry is out there, so they don't want to tarry too long. Now, the guy in charge of the fort is a Scotsman, Hector McLean, and he has a detachment of Loyalist Provincials, 2nd Battalion, 84 Regiment, and he's got about 50 men. Now, McLean doesn't sally out, he stays booked. And he's not going outside the fort because he says there's at least 400 of them. He has 50 troops. And he says, well, there's guys in the uh, hospital that can tend to themselves. Now, this illustration is not the poor burning of Fort Farrell, just an illustration from that time period I thought was representative. Now, Mayhem is going to order his men to dismount. They approach the Culleton House. They kind of cover the fort with riflemen, make sure that they're not going to get into the action. They uh, exchange fire. Now, when I say exchange fire, the best I can find is that they shot at the hospital. But the men inside the hospital who were able to bear arms did not fire back. I think it was strictly a one side, and was probably one or two kind of warning shots where I can find no mentions in their accounts. There was any casualties or any serious resistance. They're going to surrender. Now, the odds are, of course, so barely, clearly stacked up against the Colton House, they are going to uh, capture it, evacuate it, and bear in mind, it is right now supposedly filled with convalescents, people who are sick or wounded. And so these guys, they say down to bed, maybe a dozen of their number are able to fight, are simply just not going to resist. Now, the place, besides serving as a hospital, I mentioned earlier, so I also served as a depot. And according to account, had a number of arms and stores which they could not possibly bring up. And that should tell you that something is pressing because arms and stores are always very valuable to the Patriots, especially in this bitter end of the war. They, they're going to basically set fire and destroy 300 stands of arms. So they must have taken whatever they could 
they started destroying the rest. An interesting account popped up from General Moultrie, our Charleston is Moultrie. Uh, he writes his memoirs about 20 years after the revolution, and he says that Mayhem ordered the College of Hospital Torch because uh, there was liquor inside of it, and his men were getting drunk on it, and he wanted to put it into it as quick as possible. Now, 20 years afterwards, it's, a, it's sometimes hard to vouch the authenticity of his memory, but I will say that the day before, on the 16th, the British guys in the fort know that there was a schooner arrived that was carrying rum and rice. So there was rum there. And so I guess that where there's rum, the soldiers are going to find it. Now, Marion states that his doctors paroled the two officers and uh, paroled the officers of the two doctors that were there. Now, the Patriots are on the field out there for two days after this, which is some interesting questions that we're going to get to in a minute. Now, the British elsewhere in the region come aware of this attack on Farallon, and they send Major John Doyle and some of the South Carolina Royalist Dragoons to Farallon from their base at Juan Tu Plantation. Now, I showed this to you earlier, and I said I had a question or two about it. One of these says, past another British post attempted to entice British cavalry out to fight. What they have up there is almost a verbatim quote from Ripley's book about this. Um, I'm not sure where they enticed them. And maybe Charles, you might find out in the research where these guys uh, were kind of singing the British, trying to get them to come out. I don't know exactly where it is. No one mentions it. I'd guess Biggin Bridge. You think Biggin Bridge? The block, they have a block house about two miles away from Fairland, about 150 or so. But apparently the Patriots went by, tried to get them to come out, and they don't take the faith that they know they're, they're on the train. Uh, Marion does mention that Mayhem went around, uh, but we're not sure uh, exactly where it is. But if the coppers have their heels, why are they camping? But anyway, they've got scouts out there coming, the British are looking in the wrong direction. We simply just don't know. Now, after this, Carlton House is burned. Prisoners are taken. And uh, they ride away before the reinforcements can get there. The British begin blaming each other for this failure. Captain Hector McLean demands a port of inquiry. He's the guy that was holed up in the fort, refused to come out and assist the people in the hospital. Uh, he provides a paper trail that shows that his orders were to hold the post in the boat landing and never explicitly directed to keep any member of his small detachment at the hospital. He says, look, there are people there at the hospital who are sick, but some of these guys, you get up and get a weapon. So I was always the expression that, under the impression that if there was an attack, these guys need to get their muskets and go out there for the defense. And as I said earlier, he was outnumbered uh, about eight to one. So he was not about to go sacrifice his fort. He says it could not be considered an eligible undertaking with the disparity of numbers that he saw. Now, the fort is understaffed, and the Patriots knew it because, again, that blockhouse at Biggins Bridge. I think that they pulled some men that McLean would have had out there with them to guard a nearby bridge crossing. Now, a letter from Adjutant John Doyle and Francis Marion states the abstract Thor Farallon was an outrage committed upon a parcel of sick, helpless soldiers, the burning of a hospital, dragging away a number of dying people to expire in the swamps as a species of barbarity, hitherto unknown in civilized nation. That sounds pretty bad. Makes the Patriots sound like the old Tarleton is. They're going in there, burning a hospital, firing on a hospital, dragging sick guys out, leaving them to their doom in the swamps. General Nathaniel Green, master diplomat, replies back and says, essentially paraphrasing, that doesn't sound like me. I doubt that very much. You're right, hospitals should be off when they any kind of civilized war. And basically says to the British in the letter, we'll check into it. He does. He actually sends some letters to uh, Mary wanting to know what happens. Uh, Mayhem replies to these charges and says, look, the hospital was not just a normal hospital. They had fortifications around it. <coughs> Why did they put up abatee of sharpened logs around it if it was supposed to be just a place for convalescents? And he had seen a guy named Frazier with his British troops staging through that area before. People were going in and out, pulling weapons. He said it's not just a mere hospital. And he says, look, I moved 12 men who were too ill to travel. I sent them to McLean, the Scotsman in the fort. 
and the rest of them took the prisoner. He said, I didn't even make those guys march. He put them on horseback and made them trot a mile to the point. Now, roughly one week before the Battle of Fort Farrell, preparations are today to move these about 56, 56 men from hospital to Charleston. Now, this is sort of a footnote to the Battle of Fort Farrell and it's sort of lost is Major Doyle states to Captain McLean that a number of Negroes who are to be embarked in sloops at your post and forwarded by water to Charlestown are going to be there with those 50 sick men. So essentially what happens is that these enslaved individuals are being taken to St. Stephen, uh, St. John's. Basically the British are scouring the area, taking prisoners of the slaves, putting them on boats at Fort Fairlawn and sending them back to Charlestown, setting them gone for town. They round up 155 slaves in November of 1781, send them to Charlestown. What happens is anyone's guess. Where they take them to the British when they evacuated, where they put to work on the fortifications there. Did they gain their freedoms when the city was uh, taken by that by patriots? We simply don't know. But this should tell you that they are going in there and raiding, taking plunder, including human beings, uh, as war materials, setting them back to their main base in Charleston. Now, the aftermath of the Fort Farrell right, is, is considered a success. General Stewart is going to ultimately abandon his base at Wantu, and they're going to retrench closer to their main base in Charleston. This is fortified Charlestown, which you see here. Now, not having those advanced positions is going to make life difficult for his future foraging party and eventually going out and stealing slaves, stealing cattle. Uh, it's going to be a lot harder without those forward bases. They have more British prisoners from Fort Farrell, from the uh, Calton Hospital, and they're able to use those to exchange to get some of their own POWs back. Now today, and this is a shot of the earthwork. The earthwork is in remarkable condition. The parapet wall is extending two meters tall in the surrounding moat. Two meters across and one meter deep, still present. Now, looking to the future of Fort Farallon, it sat pretty much undisturbed after the Revolutionary War. Now, apart from the growth of trees and vegetation, it's intact and it's remarkably well preserved. Now, it is uh, almost as it was 200 years ago, from what I understand. And I love this. This is not my works. This is from the Battlefield Trust. They say, Fort Farallon is an archaeological treasure birth of America and the sacrifices that both Patriot and British forces made during the Revolutionary War. It is one of only two remaining Revolutionary War forts that still exist in South Carolina. And of those, it is in the best condition. The other is a national park. Fort Carolina is also unique and exists in its original state of the military site significant the Revolutionary War may have been reconstructed. Doubtless, it is the irreplaceable gem of American and British history that warrants preservation and historical interpretation. A major announcement about this work, about public access to it, is going to be forthcoming, from what I understand. Uh, folks at Lurid Work, Berkeley Trust, and the South Carolina Battlefield Trust have been hard at work, and I understand you probably see something in newspapers very soon about this. Now, whatever they decide to do with Fort Farallon, it is very close to the Berkeley Museum, and I hope that we're certainly going to be involved in its future. Uh, I want to thank you guys for listening to the for any questions you may have. Yeah. Questions? Yes, Britt. Who actually owns the property where the fort is? Keith, who's the, the actual owners of it? Keith Gordine is uh, the Lord Berkeley Trust. Who is actually the legal owners of that property now? Yeah, it was, uh, it was stayed in Mr. Cumbie's hands, but apparently there's some work. No, I can speak to that. Lord Murphy, the trust trial. Yeah, the, um, a closing has occurred in the last month where the Civil War Trust, the South Carolina Battleground Preservation Trust, and the Lord Berkeley Trust have bought the property. And the good news is the property comes right to the back of um, the Berkeley Museum there, it actually connects up, and from that museum to the readout itself is at least a half a mile, I'd say, through the woods. So there's much work yet to be done to make it publicly accessible, but it is permanently 
in the hands of these trusts and permanently preserved. And this is one of the most remarkable things that has been done after people in the Berkeley County area have been working over 20 years for that to happen. Yeah, it was a, a great, great effort on their behalf. And I remember the first time I saw Fort Fairmont, it was uh, on one of the tours that Charles and David Brewer put together, and we stopped and went in the middle of a subdivision. I said, where in the heck are you going? And he said, watch out for the snakes. <laughs> and uh, I remember that it was partially filled, but the moat was partially filled. And uh, it would have um, looked that way back, you know, in 1781, the time the British were there, that Hezekiah Mayhem, set by Francis Marion, is down there as well. Was there another question? Yes, Mr. Bounds? It, it's not a question, but uh, yeah. your reference to the 155 slaves who disappeared. Yes, sir. Uh, most of the South Carolina slaves seems to have gone to Jamaica. And I spoke to a woman from Jamaica who was a historian, and she said that there are numerous little crossroad villages in Jamaica that bear the names of South Carolina plantations, and they almost certainly are the descendants of slaves that came from those plantations. And a lot of them were not Christian when they came there because they didn't have last names. And the hallmark of Christianity arriving in this population group is that they have last names. And that's another little tidbit there. Wow, that's one of, I didn't know that. Um, any sense, Mr. Babbitts, were they uh, forced to coerce in Jamaica or were they promised any sort of enticements, any idea? Well, I'm a little cynical about that, knowing that the British branded a lot of them with the broad arrow, so I'm not so sure that there was uh, agreement to go sometime. So this is what they were removed to Jamaica after the evacuation? During this part of the evacuation. Right. That's wonderful to put that. I had and one, of, yeah. one of the ships that was involved in that was General Carlton of Whitby, which sank off Gdansk in 1785, and that ship had a convertible treasure trove of ordinary people's clothing on it. That uh, it's the best collection of common sailor clothing that's known, and it's all dated and it was all being used. Wonderful, so let me just do some looking in Jamaica apparently, see if anybody has any sources from this time frame. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. A comment. Sure. Uh, first of all, if anybody has not been to your museum, they should go because it's Thank really you. very nice. Thank you very much. I've been there a couple of times, enjoyed it. And also do this, the Santee Cooper Walk. Yeah, that's there. fantastic for our neighbors who agree to with that. I would love to go on a kayak tour, but I feel that being in the water with creatures that are the phase of my kayak is supposed to be like an MM <laughs> crunching the outside and shooting well, the inside. That's a great thing about being next to the Cooper River. You never know what's going to come from out of it. Right. Yeah. Um, just as a comment with this gentleman. Yeah. At the time, uh, the writings of the time said that most of those uh, blacks taken from the plantations were sold to slaves to the sugar plantations. And the exception to that would be, able to be the blacks that enlisted in the dragoons, the black dragoons, and they were moved mostly to Canada and they were resettled in Canada as free men. But the vast majority of them were either shipped out and sold or abandoned and basically starved to death or were died of disease around Charlestown as the, the siege got very tight and the food got very hard to get. These people were basically, many of them were simply abandoned. It, it was a tragedy all the way around. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one other little interesting thing, I spent five years working in the old exchange building, and three years of that we co-managed the old slave art museum, and we did a research project that um, a successor of mine ran through and did a great job of getting a marker put up. And we had known that slave auctions took place outside the exchange building since 1771. Um, and found, of course, that they took place inside there was inclement weather. And the old exchange building, for those who may not be familiar, is downtown East Bay's broad, um, grand old building. But essentially what he found, the first documented case of a slave auction that we can say 100% occurred was during the British occupation in 1780. So that's the first time it pops up in the newspaper without any doubt, we can say, uh, it happened first time in 1780. Pocket history says before that, but it was a British sale. So my guess is if they went back to Charlestown and they were at auction, it was probably right on that corner where the marker is newly put up on the uh, what's called Gillian Street and East Bay Street today. Just, uh, just a simple question. Sure. Uh, is, there, is there any recording of who the Scotsmen were, the common soldiers of the Peace Force? 
How did you Charles? Know, Charles? How many work? Any idea on that? They were at the 82nd? Is that right? 84. 84. 84. Um, I don't have anything like a roster, but there we do have a few more names beside Hector McLean. But not not a roster. Yeah. I went look, I couldn't find much of anything about them. Uh, any idea were they loyalists, Charles? Or were they brought directly from Scotland or were they recruited in country? It's amazing. A lot of these people have all from South Carolina, North Carolina to New York and joined this regiment. Yeah. The, and um, some of them actually got left in South Carolina when the British pulled out in 1776. Yeah. And um, it, the young Highlanders and the, the rest of the 84th, um, uh, I don't know where all they came, but there's a good many North Carolina Highlanders in there, left from Moore's Creek Bridge, and then I'm sure they had uh, others that they picked up in the upper U.S. I can't imagine that uh, McLean got a warm reception from the guys from the hospital. So the guys that were arriving on horseback, you know, from said, what happened? <laughs> you know, and he's still sitting behind the walls of the sport looking out. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yes, Willard. And get the website uh, of the museum and the hours. <laughs> Willard Strong is the chairman of the museum board. And so, uh, interested party asked me to uh, get the website, which is berkeleymuseum.org. And Willard's my, my greatest ally at the museum. We both have a love of the revolution. And uh, he's going to be my partner in working, getting a new exhibit up and helping me get those cannons restored. So it's at berkeleymuseum.org. Uh, hopefully, a big change going on in its displays for the next year. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, have we done a time? All right. Thank you very much.